Bob has always wanted to be creative. He will spend hours just staring at his notepad, thinking of something to write, but nothing comes to his mind. He can't create. He has no idea why. Brandon, he's a creative machine. He runs through a million ideas a day. He publishes four books every year. He's um, just sheer brilliance and genius in one. Rebecca, she's constantly frustrated with Brandon. I mean, why can he never do anything properly? He keeps leaving doors unlocked. He keeps forgetting to close the kitchen <laughs> when he opens it. He keeps finding himself uh, leaving spelling errors and mistakes and notes around. He forgets to clean up after himself. Brandon, Bob and Rebecca, they're three different polar opposites and they illustrate perfectly the real raw truth on creative people. Why are creative people so messy? Why is it so hard to be creative? And why can't creative people just develop more attention to detail? To illustrate this concept, I've drawn up this board. This board illustrates creative momentum. What does creative momentum really mean? Well, basically, first of all, creativity, it follows on a scale. <laughs> and first of all, the first part of creativity is known as the burn. What is the burn? Well, the burn is that time where you sit staring at the notepad nothing coming to your mind. Your brain wants to be creative. It wants to create, but it has no idea where to begin. It has no input, no sense of direction. What kind of ideas do you want me to create? What kind of things do you want me to do? You want me to do, to put something where there is nothing? How am I going to do that? That time period for the brain to create and to start up a creative process is known as the burn. And that can be a really difficult one. And Bob, he's stuck in that burn. Maybe sometimes he will get past that burn and he'll start coming up with one or two ideas. And the problem is here, Bob keeps shooting down his own ideas. Oh no, that's stupid. No, that's wrong. Oh my God, I should not have written it like that. That just feels wrong. That just feels off. I don't know if that's going to work. Bob is constantly monitoring his own process, trying to check for detail. He wants to be creative and he wants to create, but he also wants to have a high precision in his work. He wants to make sure that he covers his track. He wants to make sure that what he creates is logical, accurate, smooth, well-written and perfect in terms of execution. Bob will never get past that burn because he's trying to look left and right at the same time. The burn is uh, what happens whenever your brain is trying to switch from one task to another. Note that there are processes in your brain that run counter to other processes. What that means is if you are trying to engage in one process, you will do so always at the expense of another process. This also means that the longer time you spend at the task, the more momentum you build. What you'll see here in this graph is that creativity escalates. That means from having a time spent doing basically nothing, creativity slowly starts to increase in momentum until you reach a tipping point, a creative tipping point, where all your lines and threads that you have started to scatter about, all these random plot holes and ideas and uh, threads and possibilities that you've started to gather out, you basically ended up uh, dotting out, oh, this, this, maybe that, maybe that, maybe that, maybe that, maybe that, you know. All of these things start coming together and interacting between each other. And it's when these creative connections escalate that momentum builds. Basically, the longer time you spend being creative at the task, the more easy it becomes to be creative. The creative flow, which is, happens here between the tipping point and between the height, uh, the creative top, is basically when you are building so many connections that your mind is 
basically overflowing with ideas. And this is only going to escalate until you hit the point where basically your mind can no longer handle all the connections that are being made. It, this creative flow, this rush of dopamine where you're like, oh, and that and that, and I can put this there and I can change that and I can adjust that. All those things that will continue to escalate until you hit that creative roof. And that's basically your creative muscle. It's the same as when you are at the gym and you're pulling lifts and you hit basically a weight that you cannot lift anymore. It's the exact same thing. That creative roof where you hit the very peak where you're like so full of ideas that you basically your mind is on. You're so full of ideas in this process that you basically hit the point where you hit brain overload and you crash. The crash is an important part of the creative process and it will happen every time you hit that roof. Every time you are so creative that basically your mind <laughs> hits an error. Too many <laughs> ideas. ROM overloaded, you know. Uh, for some people that roof is lower and for some people that roof is higher. And that's why some people are able to be incredibly creative. Now, I consider myself to be an incredibly creative type and you should see it. I've published hundreds of videos, I've written thousands of articles, I have, uh, I'm known as a creative at work and in every domain that I go. Creativity is one of the most fun things for me and one of the things I enjoy the very, very most in life. However, a lot of people will say that, hey Eric, these things that you create, they ha they're kind of sloppy, you know? For example, I released a new personality test on objective personality recently. I'll share the link down below if you're curious. And this test, when I released it, it had several bugs. It's the first ever 512 type personality test out there. No other personality test has that many personality tests programmed in it. The algorithms that I use to build this test are some of the most complicated that I've ever written. I've spent hours writing this test and proofing it. I've spent, I think, more than a week uh, making sure that it was correct. The amount of time spent building this and putting this all together is huge, but for somebody that just looks at it, it can be easy to look and say, hey, uh, this algorithm is broken, or this scale that you built in this particular spot should have been different. And it's so easy to look at this and to say, hey Eric, why don't you spend more time proofing your work? Why don't you spend more time working with attention to detail? Well, the reason why I brought up Brandon, Bob and Rebecca was because we don't have to and we should not have to choose. If we are forced to choose to spend as much time on creative thinking as we are on attention to detail, we will lose creative momentum. That means if you are constantly trying to proof and fix your own work and edit your own details and make sure that you maintain a degree of pre precision, you might stay in this sweet spot. You'll get stuck, just like Bob. You'll find yourself constantly going back and forth and you'll find yourself never getting anywhere. Yeah, creative types are comfortable. Creative types are comfortable leaving room for errors and making leaps of judgment in order to work forward with a promise of an idea. So, of course, we know that there are creative types that are incredibly brilliant and have and execute their work almost flawlessly. And that's why I bring up Brandon. Brandon, he's a smart guy. He's incredibly creative. But, you know, he spent years trying to get his first books published. His first book was not that impressive. Actually, he sent in tons of books to different publishers but most people have thought no this is too messy this is too complicated this is too weird this is too far out there this is too different you know he didn't make any leverage he didn't make any progress on this road people saw all the errors he was making people saw yeah he's creative but he's making a lot of leaps he's missing a lot of detail he's missing a lot of attention i don't think we can publish this but there were editors that saw, okay, this is a guy with promise. 
okay, this guy has a lot of ideas. And if I help him, and if I sit down and I work through all those details and correct all those plot holes and show him all those errors and fix all those issues for him, I can make his process easier and I can make him successful. Yeah, as a creative, if you are incredibly creative, probably the best thing you can do is hire a proofreader, find an editor, find people that love and have high attention to detail, people that enjoy spending time fixing and troubleshooting and editing and pro proofreading all your work, people that enjoy that stuff because they're out there. You know, just as you enjoy and want to spend all your time being creative, there are people out there that enjoy editing, fixing and proofing and building and correcting and structuring and organizing information. So the best thing you can do is find people to do that for you so that you can spend as much time as possible in that creative flow. And that brings us to the problem of individualism. Individualism was a movement that came about in the 1900s and it was an, a really important one, an important step in human evolution because up until that point we had been very tied down by our tribe. Most of us grew up in small villages where everyone knew everyone and everyone worked together on the farm and on mutual projects to work together. You know, individualism was the break of that. It was, hey, I can go out and do my own thing and become successful and rich doing my own business and running my own tasks and working on my own projects. Individualism was great. <laughs> However, individualism has a set of problems. First, if you're all alone working on your own projects, there is as much of a chance that you're going to make it as that you're going to break it. <laughs> yeah, you're just as likely to succeed and reach and jump into new heights as you are to fall and drown. And if you're all alone, nobody's gonna help you if you're out there floating about, unable to get through life, constantly stuck on the waves, you know. <laughs> nobody's gonna be able to help you. There is no security in that. And that means you're gonna be a bit afraid, a bit cautious. You're gonna be like, I don't know if I can venture that far out or take that many risks because, uh, I don't want to crash, I don't want to drown, and nobody else is here, so nobody else is going to be able to help me. But if you know that you have a security net, if you know that you have people around you that pick up your slack, people around you that are going to help you, it's going to be, oh, actually, I can swim pretty far out because I've got this rope tied to me and the people out there that are going to help me if I start to twitch it, you know. <laughs> uh, creative types uh, benefit from having a community that enjoys and finds interesting to hear about new ideas. That means surround yourself with open-minded people that enjoy hearing about new thoughts and new theories. If you can have these kind of people around you to monitor, test and give feedback on your work, you're gonna find it a lot easier to spread your wings and to say and try and do new things. Now, one problem that can come about uh, from having this community is that this community might try, try to tie you down or hold you back. A lot of creatives can end up feeling stuck in this community because you'll find that there are things that you're allowed to do and things you're not allowed to do. When you are surrounded by people, friends, family, you might find that your friends and family members are always giving you a hard time. They're always going like, yeah, uh, that's not politically correct, or you can't say that, or you cannot do that, or you cannot uh, work with this idea. And you should go into that career, and you should focus on that. You know, like you have people around you that will try to insert and control your path and destination and journey. People that are trying not just to help you succeed, but also people that are trying to shape and form you into what they think you should be. And that's why it's so important to know that you want to find people that are open-minded and curious and people that are not afraid to let you drift. People need to be okay with letting you drift. They need to be okay with the fact that sometimes you're going to say stupid things. Sometimes you're going to take make certain leaps that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> They should be people that know, okay, this is his process. This is part of his flow. This is part of what he does. He's going to go into this direction and it's going to look weird or it's going to be look off, but I trust him. I have faith in the fact that he's going to, he knows what he's doing and he's going to wrap it all together and bring it in the right direction. If you can have people like that, that focus on 
just being part of and following your process and listening to you and hearing you as you go through all these weird shifts and turns, it's going to be a lot easier to be creative. That means you want to have people around you that are going to that aren't going to micromanage your process too much or try to hold you back too much. Yeah, if they tell you, no, I think you should go into uh, children's literature instead uh, with this kind of writing, you know, <laughs> and you feel like, no, I want to go into fantasy or science fiction, yeah, trust your gut, you know, don't let other people hold you back or micromanage or control or pigeonhole you too much. And that's um, the other part that I want to bring up on creativity. I'm going to show you a clip real quick about Brandon Sanderson. Brandon Sanderson is a really successful writer and he's publish, able to publish up to two books every year and he's known to be one of the fastest writers out there. You know, um, he's on a pace similar to Stephen King when it comes to writing and that's really incredible. And in this clip you're going to see how his brainstorming process works. And what I want to show you with this process is that he doesn't just create or have ideas but he's also very good at managing a creative flow a part of uh, being creative is not just having ideas but it's having good ideas that means knowing in the direction and which way and in how to manage and to control your creative process anyone can have ideas you can come up with the most <laughs> random ghibli gobbly gook that you ever want to at any given moment if you want to but to have good ideas and to be creative and to be attentive during a creative process and to not just create but to see these ideas are relevant and these are irrelevant these ideas seem to have promise and these seem to not have promise that is one of the core hallmarks of being truly creative creativity is not just to be able to have ideas but it's able the ability to manage your process and evaluate and to steer your creativity in a certain direction so creative momentum requires you to constantly supervise your own creativity not to evaluate or troubleshoot or pick it apart but rather to say these are the kind of ideas or this is the way or the direction that i want this creative flow to go basically do you want to have ideas about this topic or that topic? Do you want to have these? What kind of ideas are you looking for? And what kind of manner would you like to exercise your creativity? And part of that is learning to flow with your own values and your own interests. So if there's something you're super passionate about or something you care about very much, just making sure that your creativity stay, stays within that arena of things that you're passionate about and things that you care about. And Beyond that, it's uh, noticing what kind of structure that works best for your creativity. And that's what kind of structure supports your creativity and what kind of structure inhibits it. Note that there is a kind of criticism that is going to leave you feeling like everything sucks and like you're all out of energy and steam. And there is a kind of criticism that is going to make you go, oh yeah, and then we can do this. So know what kind of structure to fit your creativity. And that's why a lot of creatives actually have rules for how to be creative. Rules for how to be creative. Doesn't that, isn't that wrong? Isn't creativity supposed to be as free flow? Wrong. <laughs> Rules are an important integral part of creativity. Creative people have an incredible amount of rules and you should ask them what kind of rules do you have when you're being creative? Maybe they won't know but if you listen to their creative process and you start having a brainstorm with them you'll notice that they're very quick to steer and control you. They're gonna be like no not that, not that, not that. They're gonna filter, they're gonna arrange, they're gonna have a system or approach to which they are being creative and that's interesting because uh, that's something you're gonna have to learn to figure out on your own what kind of rules are going to support your creative flow and what kind of method and structures are going to help you boost your ideas perhaps just sitting and staring at the notebook isn't going to help you be creative perhaps you need rules perhaps you need to write lists with systems to look at and bounce off perhaps you need to go out perhaps you need to work outside perhaps you need to uh, balance input and output so to have a discussion or a group session for it to be creative or perhaps you're gonna to need to distance yourself from other people or be more alone in order to support your creativity. So knowing these kind of rules is knowing how to enter into a creative flow. Now, the truth about creativity is simply this. You cannot be creative and perfect at the same time. 
if you're gonna be very creative, you're gonna be very flawed. <laughs> if you're gonna be uh, very perfectionistic, you're not gonna be very creative. Knowing that you have to choose between these two things is important. You have a choice to make on what kind of a person you want to be. Do you want to be perfect? Do you want to be creative? What's your choice? Thank you all for watching and hope to see you all in the next video. Um, I usually want to start with a good idea for a character. An idea for a character is really a character conflict. All right? A good character conflict. Then you mix that with a plot idea. Plot is generally the place where you're going to take, um, where it's going to be the least original. People talk about there only being a certain number of plots, and to an extent it's true. Um, I don't want to, you know, again, downplay the art of all of this um, and whatnot, but there are certain forms you use to tell a story, um, a certain plot arcs that have been very successful, and most stories are going to fall into these. Um, you know, the underdog success story, or the, the, the journey, the quest, the mystery, these sorts of things are kind of the plot it is. But you can have an interesting idea for your twist on an interesting plot, okay? And so I usually start when I have a, when I have a few of each of these, and they begin combining in interesting ways, and that makes me want to write a story. So we're going to try brainstorming this today, and um, I want... We're going to do this differently than I did it last year. And we'll maybe do this the way I did it last year um, during the character thing. But why don't we go ahead and brainstorm a couple of a rich, uh, interesting setting concepts. Places you haven't seen a story take place. A magic system based on something interesting. Or a world element that you, you haven't seen. Something that just pops into your head. What, have, what, what would be cool? What, just throw them out at me. OK, Stone Age Africa. Good setting. I'm actually going to try and write these so you can read them, because we'll need them later. Um, magic system based on innate talents. Innate talents, OK, talent based. OK, what else? Places. Let's, places okay. You know what, let's just do places right now. We'll do magic in a second. Do places. Floating islands. Floating islands, OK. What else? OK, OK. <laughs> wow, very nihilist, yes. All right, what, what else do we got? I interesting places. It doesn't have to be things like this. What's, um, what's, a, what's a room or a profession that someone could have that has an interesting setting attached to it? A OK, a dentist office. OK, I like that. Cathedral. OK, cathedral. What's different about this cathedral? <laughs> no, 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 this is good. See? You're laughing, but this is good. Space Cathedral, huh? 